from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Kelly is the state, state excuse me, the uh, state poet laureate of Virginia. Uh, she was appointed uh, state poet laureate by Governor Bob McDonald in July 2010. I also don't want to miss the opportunity to mention that we have state centers for the book in each of the states represented today, and in fact in all of the states, and that and Kelly will be uh, signing, reading and signing at the uh, Virginia Festival of the Book, uh, which will be next March. And we are joined today by Susan Coleman, who is the coordinator of the Virginia Center for the Book, and I want her to stand up and be recognized. Susan, thank you. Uh, Kelly actually uh, succeeded as State po uh, Poet Laureate of Virginia. She succeeded Claudia Emerson, who read yesterday in the uh, Poet, and Claudia is with us. She was in Poetry and Prose, and let's give her a hand as well. And if there are any other Virginia celebrities in the audience, let me know by the time this is completed. I'd appreciate it. Uh, Kelly Cherry has published 20 books of fiction, poetry, and in nonfiction, eight chapbooks and translations and two, of two classical plays. Her most recent titles are The Retreats of Thought, Poems, published in 2009, and Girl in a Library, that's a, on, on women writers and the writing life. She, uh, in 2009, she was the first recipient of the Haynes Poetry Prize given by the Fellowship of Southern Writers for a Body of Work. Other honors include a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Rockefeller Foundation and the Bradley Major Achievement Lifetime Award. Kelly is the Eudora Welty Professor Emerita of English and Evju Bascom Professor Emerita in the Humanities at the Virgi University of Wisconsin in Madison. Kelly is going to read, let's give her a hand, She's not only going to read, but Kelly also is going to take a few minutes for questions and answers at the end of her presentation. Now is the time for all of us to welcome her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. I'll go listen and we'll raise the mic. If okay. And um, I want to thank the Library of Congress for having me here. This is the first time I've been at this festival, and my husband and I have had a lot of fun so far. Can you hear me? It's okay. Okay. Um, I, first of all, rather self-defensively would like to say that I don't always write about myself. I write about a lot of other things, too. But because we were encouraged to um, tell something about our lives as writers, I've picked a few poems to connect with the story of my life. There are other poems. The first thing is I was born into a musical family. My parents were string quartet violinists. And I cannot tell you what that music meant to me. From before, born, from before I was born, I was hearing it. Um, my mother made a special effort to play classical records while she was carrying me. And as soon as I got out of her body, I was crawling around uh, on the floor in the middle of a string quartet. And that's how I grew up. I loved it. I, um, I, think, I think my parents knew how much I loved Beethoven. That was what they specialized in, in the Beethoven string quartets. But I'm not sure they ever knew how grateful I am to them for having brought me up on that music. I wish I could tell them now. I had piano lessons, and it was not long before I realized I would never be a pianist. First of all, I don't have the hands, but also I had a small temperament problem. Whenever I tried to play something and made a mistake, 
I would start it over and take it twice as fast and make two mistakes. So I really wasn't temperamentally suited for the piano. <laughs> when I was about 12, I wrote a poem. I don't know what prompted me to write it. It was the least precocious poem I think any writer has ever written. It was something about a woman who was dressed all in white from head to toe and how she shone in the moonlight glow. So, not genius, right? But it set a bell off in my head, just making that simple, conventional, trite rhyme suddenly exploded in my mind and I thought, this is my form of music. When I announced that to my parents, I was standing in the doorway of my bedroom and I announced to my parents, who happened to be there, that um, I was going to be a writer. Whereupon my mother screamed and ran to the kitchen to get a carving knife because she was not going to have another writer in the family. My big brother had preceded me and was something of a beatnik. I must say, I've read, recently read two memoirs in which women writers talk about their mothers taking a knife to them. So it seems to be something that runs in certain families. But I'm here to say that I must be the oldest it must have happened to me first, before the other two who've already written about it. I just want to read a little poem that shows you how much, even after all these years, I love rhyme. This is a little poem called Musica Universalis, which is the Latin term for harmony of the spheres. The classical harmony of the spheres abrades any doubt about the message of the music, that he who hears must write it down for humankind, or that one soul who happens on the long lost score wherein the wheeling cosmos serenades the brilliance of its stars, the mystery at its core. So. I, I still think rhyme is a marvelous, marvelous instrument, whether it's slant or total or the first syllable rhyme of a word rhyming with the second syllable of a, another word. I think it's a gorgeous tool. I also thought I would read a short poem <coughs> about my parents. Now they had, uh, as I said, had a string quartet all their lives. It had different names depending on what city they were in. But they always had a, a string quartet and they did various concerts um, quite professionally and they specialized in late Beethoven. <laughs> Things change, of course, over the years. By the time my parents were celebrating their golden anniversary, in 1983, illnesses had begun to make themselves known, and I wrote this epithalamium for their anniversary. Although he is still surprised that it has turned out this way after all the years when it seemed it wouldn't, my father loves my mother so much that there are times when he is afraid he is going to die of it the anxiety, and there are times when he thinks that would be a relief, better than the dis-ease of heart that awaits him when she goes. With his arthritic fingers, he threads the needle she can no longer see the eye of. Thank you. Well, I grew up in Richmond, and 
not too long ago, a couple of years ago, I, we, we now live back in Virginia, and the heat in Virginia reminded me of the way it used to be in the days before air conditioning, when the heat was just amazing. I don't know how many of you might remember that. Uh, there was air conditioning in movies and in certain restaurants, but by and large, people didn't have air conditioning in their houses, and Richmond gets hot. This is a poem called The Heat Down South, Richmond, 1955. The heat does something wonderful and difficult for Northerners to grasp. It says a silent benediction. It houses us in torpor. A halo of humidity surrounds the porch. The people are robed in sweat and none contrive to do much more than read a magazine. To turn the fan to on is strenuous, and so is reaching for a beer. Night may bring relief or trouble, but tonight's forever from now. A six-foot floor fan shuffles the air, which doesn't cool the room, and no one stirs, and nothing else is moving. Telephones won't ring. Forget the will to power. We haven't the will to say hello. No one knocks. You are secured from all assaults upon your consciousness, and there is nothing to keep you from imagining a wiser nation might arise among the fields and woods, the birds at liberty, the lions lying down with the lambs. Thank you. Um, I moved from the South to New York when I married my first husband, and I have some divorce poems, but I think maybe I'll skip those. <laughs> I'll move right into the next big stage of my life, which was when I met a Latvian composer. This was in the days of the Soviet Union, and he was... he. We wanted to get married. You know, he, when I met him in the Hotel Metropole in Moscow, he was wearing a black turtleneck sweater. I was wearing a black turtleneck sweater. That was it. That's all it took. Um, I later, tr uh, at first time I was over there, the uh, Soviet authorities didn't take us very seriously. We just couldn't get anywhere with them, and they clearly thought we were a couple of kids. I went back 10 years later, after my first marriage and after his marriage, and um, saw him again. And this time, the Soviet authorities took us very seriously. Spies came out of the network, out of, out of the woodwork, and uh, correspondence was uh, censored or lost altogether. My fiance was warned by the union of composers uh, that this would be the end of his career. But we kept trying. And for one period of time, I was able to spend some time there. Uh, and we spent one night in a little cottage that belonged to a friend of his, a woman who worked in theater. And the cottage was, had a blue painted floor, ivy over all the windows, including um, um, the screens. So it was beautifully secret. Now we knew that a few feet down the driveway there was a Volga, which was, at that time was what they sent Soviet spies out in. And the point was that we should know if they were there because it was supposed to scare us. But it had the opposite effect. We felt kind of hidden in this secret little tent in our own room. This is a poem about being in that room. It's called Reading, Dreaming, Hiding. You asked me, what is the good of reading the Gospels in Greek? That's from Cheslov Miłosz's poem, Readings. 
I must say it is in his poem a totally mysterious line. I have no idea what it's doing in his poem, but I think it's beautiful, so I put it in my poem. You were reading. I was dreaming the color blue. The wind was hiding in the trees and rain was streaming down the window full of darkness. Rain was dreaming in the trees. You were full of darkness. The wind was streaming down the window, the color blue. I was reading and hiding. The wind was full of darkness and rain was streaming in the trees and down the window. The color blue was full of darkness, dreaming in the wind and trees. I was reading you. Well, we did not manage to get married. I finally was called into the State Department and told that they had had word from the highest Soviet levels that the marriage would never have been permitted. Um, this all went against the Helsinki Accords, according to which I should have been able to live there as an American citizen, send my work out uncensored, and get paid through Chase Manhattan Bank in Moscow. We found out there is not a word of truth to any of that. So I had to get a job, quick. And I wound up at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where I felt very much like a single woman among Midwestern married couples. So I, I had a little house, it was a brick house, and I wrote a poem called Woman Living Alone, partly as an attempt to show that even a single woman has some very nice things going on in her life. It's called Woman Living Alone. A book on the bed, radio turned to a classical station, raining or not raining, but if it is, the water rushes into the bushes by the side of the brick house, bridal wreath bushes, their white flowers like snow in spring. If it is not raining, there may be a blue sky like a blessing being pronounced over a meal, which, though taken alone, tastes of life. And I'm happy to say I am no longer single. My husband's over there. Um, and we now live, I've retired from the University of Wisconsin, and we now live in South, South Side, Virginia, down near the North Carolina border. We have a little farm, a very funky little farm, that my husband's in the process of renovating. Um, and we have 40 acres and a uh, pond and lots of trees, and we love it. I wrote this poem after we were married and in that farmhouse, and it's titled Blue Jay, and I did see a blue jay that prompted this poem. I saw a blue jay in the cedar tree today. He soon flew off to a farther spot where holly trees grow dark starry leaves beside the tool shed fanning stylish wings as he settled down, safe for the duration. Tonight, with sudden weather homing in on our small part of the state, I think again about the startle of his tail, the reaching art that took him here to there. Um, let me ask how I'm doing on time. Excuse me? Okay, then I'm going to read one more poem. Um, if I can see where. Oh, no, I've got two more poems. Okay. This is a little poem called. I have a book. This, this by the way, is a picture of our farm on this book. And my husband took that photograph. And this is the more recent book, 
And I'm going to read a po little poem called Sex. It's actually, believe it or not, a book of sonnets about philosophy. But I, it seemed wrong to leave sex out of everything. So this is sex. Friction, transference of bodily fluid. There is nothing immaterial in any of this, nothing sprightly or druid about us, nothing angelic, saintly or zen. I pant, you pant, our arms and legs entwine as if we mean to yoke ourselves together. That leg behind your back, isn't it mine? Oh, about sex, there is nothing ethereal. It's grinding hip bones and pumping elbows. It's a foot in the face, the dizzy kiss that can't remember what part of the body it goes on. And who cares if the laggard mind might miss out or construe the nipple as a rose? Almost you trade philosophy for this. I, I'm, I must say I loved philosophy. I was a grad student of philosophy at UVA. Um, and I, of course, I don't remember things like logical analysis, but I loved asking th those questions. And now, the one more poem. Maybe I better skip this poem and go straight to Q&A. Okay, this is called Of Life and Time. And it's written for my husband. Time felt expands and shrinks according to the number of details that we observe. The less familiar an experience, the more details we notice, lengthening the time it takes. And the more ordinary, the fewer details adhere. And yet your face, better known to me than is my name, is creased and folded like a well-used map, a place in which I'd live a million years if I could, every year a century, every century a millennium. And all that lengthy while, I'll register the play of light upon your light green eyes, silver stubble and mobile mouth, the way you clear your throat to say a thing clever or punning such minute observations to me are Shakespearean dramaturgy and bespeak a narrative of close detail that makes each single moment as riveting as insight and as lingering as a poem about the inexhaustible theme of love. Thank you. I'm very happy to try to answer any questions anyone might have. I love getting questions. Is anyone going to ask me? Good. I have a question. I picked up your girl in the library yesterday um, mm -hmm. and loved it and already am half through it. And I'm wondering what advice you have to someone who would like to do fiction. I'm a magazine editor and journalist. Uh, but can't really do an MFA program like you did. Okay, I need, I need someone to repeat that to me up here. Can, Burke, did you hear that? Sorry. Okay. Hi. You may need to repeat. I heard the last part of it, which was about, uh, well, uh, Kelly has an MFA degree, but you're interested in writing, but with but getting into it without having the right. degree. Is that with, it? Without going to an MFA. I'm without an MFA, right. You should never go for an MFA if you're going to go into debt for it, because the MFA will not get you a job. It, it's a good credential um, that will help you to get a job, but it will not get you one. I think MFAs are exceedingly useful. I went to such a program and I loved it and I found it very useful. But if, just remember for centuries and centuries and centuries, people have been writing books without MFAs. The most important thing you need to do is read. If you read a lot, 
you'll learn how to write. I promise. You mentioned that you love rhyme, yeah. but I don't hear it in your poetry. Is there a reason? Is it because it's not appreciated? Did you, did you hear the first poem I read? I did hear there's, that. There's rhyme in that poem. A lot of rhyme. Is there a reason why you don't do it more often? Excuse me? Is there a reason why you don't use rhyme more often? Uh, I just, I write a lot of poems with rhyme in them. And um, I write a lot of poems without rhyme in them. And the reason is I just like to write everything. But rhyme, I think, is a very important musical uh, function. It helps, it helps the music of the poem. It helps it make it memorable. Um, it adds, adds a certain amount of drama. And it, 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 it attracts the eye as well as the ear. I think those are all good reasons for using a lot of rhyme. Plus, of course, uh, when you rhyme, and you're not rhyming toe and glow, <laughs> the need to rhyme will force you to go other places, and you will surprise yourself about what will come out in the poem. It can be very exciting. Yeah. Do you talk a little bit about how you deal with writing about real life, your life, and the lives in your life, the other people in your life? Uh, my family gave me permission to write about them, for which I'm forever grateful. They said, we don't care. If, you can be, if we can be of any use to you, go ahead. Um, and I have used them in various things. But I also write a lot of short stories and novels that have nothing to do with my life. And I write a lot of poems that are not about my parents or my brother or my sister. I just like to write about everything. I like to write about everything, and I like to write in almost every form. Thank you. Thank you. Because you switch genres and you write fiction and essay and poetry, can you talk a little bit about your writing schedule or when you choose to switch? Yeah. I chose to switch simply because ideas came to me. And they would come to me most of the time, not always, but most of the time, in a certain rhythm. And it would seem to me to be either the rhythm of a poem, which is based on line, or the rhythm of a short story, which is based on sentence, or the voice, the rhythm of an essay, which is based on the paragraph, or the rhythm of a novel, which is based on scene. Now, there are lots of writers, as we all know, who move, uh, who like to work at the edge of these boundaries. But I found that having a very clear sense of the rhythmic changes from one form to another helped me to get into the other form when I was ready to work in it. When I first started out, it would take me three months to make a change from, say, fiction to poetry. And during those three months, I would write hideously bad poetry. I, had to, I sort of had to learn how to write poetry all over again. Now I don't have to do that. I can write uh, fiction in the morning and poems at night. And I love, I love having that freedom. And I advocate it for anyone who's interested. There's no reason to stick to one form unless that's really all you want to work in. Okay. I think I think that's it. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to say thank you very much. I'm trying to remember if I met you three years ago on a cruise with Dolores Kendricks on the uh, water over here in D.C. Uh, um, but most importantly, I want to say thank you because I'm a poet who started to be a poet because I wanted to write songs. I love music, uh -huh. and I can't sing, but I went somewhere where someone was speaking poetry, and I said, I can do that. Good, so good. So I, I love rhyme, and also I just recently applied for a, uh, the John Hopkins University, and I was turned down, and I was a little bit let down at first, 
Mm-hmm. But then I realized, like you said, for centuries, and I understand it's God that writes the poems through me. And mm-hmm. um, understanding that gave me a certain amount of confidence that mm-hmm. when I succeed, he will get the glory and not somebody else. And uh, the last point, I, I, I kind of lost it in the middle of saying that, but it's, um, mm-hmm. if I could get a moment to think. Um, a lot of poetry, like you say, read a lot of poems. A lot mm-hmm. of poets speak in such ways that are so ethereal, that's so colorful, that's so out there that sometimes I'm sitting back saying, what do you talk about, you know? Mm-hmm. And I, ch- I tend to use words that convey to the common person the experience, like a song, like rhyme. Right. I think that clarity is one of the greatest responsibilities of any writer. And I think that style is not something added on to the writing. Style is what grows out of that search for clarity. So you're doing the right thing. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.